Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venicia, this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and today is episode 15 of the series. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and choosing to spend some quality knitting time with me. I hope you have an exciting project that you're intending to work on while I chat you through the latest updates on my projects and show you off my finished objects. I have uh, finished a top, obviously, a hat and a pair of socks and then there's a few works in progress that you've seen and a few new cast on as well as some exciting swatches and plans for the future so if that's of any interest to you then keep on watching thank you so much for all the love on the last couple of videos that i've done on ravelry and on hand eye yarn they've been really well received there's a few new faces so if you're coming from those videos then hi hello i hope that you also like the podcast and it's also very encouraging to know that I can stray away from the podcast format and do those one-off videos and you guys are interested in, in those as well as the podcast. But I still think that filming the podcast is my favorite things to do. So yeah, um, before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping as always. You can find me on other social media like Ravelry and Instagram at The Woolly Worker. Same as here on YouTube. There's a Ravelry group also that you can join where I will hopefully at some point soon organize a minion knit along. Something small to begin with, just to dip my toes in. I also have a very detailed description box below where you can find links to any projects I mentioned, designers, patterns, colorway names. I know that's important to you, so I always make sure to include the color of the yarn. And if you go on Ravelry, you can find even more details in terms of the amounts of yarns that I've used, the dimensions of the final objects, etc, etc. So make sure to click the description. And also there's chapters or timestamps if you want to skip ahead or... Um, just skip any parts, you're welcome to do that. So yeah, I think that's it for housekeeping, so let's just get started right into it. Uh, the first thing is finished object, and as you can see I'm, I'm wearing one of them, it's the Qtar top by Sari Nordland. So I will um, be putting photos on screen of me modeling it as I'm speaking, and yeah, I'll just let you know about the specs of the pattern. It's a lace panel at the front and a lace panel at the back that you work flat. The lace is done on both right side and wrong side rows. It's based on Japanese lace stitches. And then you join in the round and you work the body down. I chose to do the A-line shaping that Sari suggests. So there's a few increases along the way to make it slightly taper out, which I really like. And it's my first garment doing that. And I just wanted to see whether it suited me and I do like it. So I'm happy that I did it. Then it's finished with a double folded hem, which I was intimidated by at first. Uh, I usually, when I'm sewing down something, I, I knit it down, like the neck edging. I just keep it on the needles and then knit it together with the cast on edge. I just find it more comfortable to, to still do it while I have everything live on the needles. But I know a lot of people prefer to cast off first and then whip stitch. And this is what Sari recommended and I thought, you know what, let's try a new technique for once and I'm glad that I did. It was, so I bound it off knitwise and I tried not to do it too tightly. I was considering going up a needle size but I didn't and it was fine. I just made sure to be quite loose and then after that I sewed it down using a video that was so 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 helpful that I put in my Ravelry notes because that really helped me figure out what stitch to put my um, sewing needle into to whip stitch the hem together and I love the result that it gives it's so polished so professional so clean so smooth I was pleasantly surprised by the end of sewing down the whole edge that I had stayed on the same line the whole way around so it's not crooked or misaligned or anything it was just it was perfect it went fast enough that it wasn't that like discouraging to just do it in one sitting and yeah so really happy with that then I blocked it and I didn't attach the straps yet. Uh, I joined them after blocking because that was my way of getting around the issues that people have with eye cords stretching way too much and then not having an accurate representation of the length. So I also made a modification in the fact that Sari recommends working eye cords at the front and then at the back and then you kitchener them at the shoulders. But I didn't want to have my join at the top of the shoulder because I thought that would be more noticeable. So what I did was that I made one extra long eye cord at the front and then I just worked maybe five rounds of an eye cord at the back just to have something to work with. And then I joined everything at the back and I'll be showing a video of the close up of that on the screen. And I think I did a good job at making it as seamless and as not bulky as possible. And 
if there is something to see, then they'll be placed at the back, which hopefully no one is really paying attention to. I certainly forget, because if I look at it on my uh, shoulder, there's not really anything that you can see. I really like the fact that the I-cord is more than just a three-stitch I-cord. I think it gives more stability, which is really good. And also, this pattern has a lot of I-cord finishing, like on the front panel, at the underarm, um, and the straps and everything, and it was quite fiddly. If you've been watching Amy from Ninet, she was knitting this top at the same time that I was, and she also just put out a video where she talks about her finished object, and I really agree with her that this was a very fiddly top to work, but it's so worth it. It just, you need to know what you're getting into. I, I found that there was just so much start and stopping with this, where you had to keep on checking for fit, for length, for gauge for measurements of the panels for when to join at the underarm how long to make the straps i blocked my front panel as well like before making the rest because i wanted to see how it would lay on my chest and then i also blocked it like i said before stretch before putting the straps on so this project took quite a while it was on small needles the body was like a sea of stockinettes but i found that kind of relaxing and enjoyable compared to all the other things that you had to do with the top like the eye cord and straps which I had done before doing the body because I just wanted to get it over with. Um, I can't remember if I showed this in my previous video. I think I did, but um, I had put some stitches on hold on some scrap yarn and it was hand dyed yarn and it bled a little bit, but that's at the back and I really just forget. So it doesn't bother me too much. I also wanted about like zero ease for this or a bit of negative ease even because I know that the silk is gonna end up stretching and I made the size two of the garment, but my, no, I made the size three. No, I made the size two, sorry. I made the size two, my gauge was a bit different, um, but I put all of that information on, on Ravelry or I spoke about it already. Um, let me just check my notes. I don't know if I've said, but I've made this on 275 bamboo needles and I used knitting for olive pure silk. I almost used two balls exactly. I just like made the body shorter because I wanted it to hit my natural sort of hip waist, but no lower than that. And Sari's recommended length was a bit too long for my taste. I tried it on at some point and I thought that was fine. So I'm happy that I went with my gut and did the length that I liked and felt comfortable with. And in the end it, was, it worked out well because then I had a bit of extra yarn, which was good to know as opposed to playing yarn chicken the whole time. And because I had already done all the finishing, I knew that it was just a matter of length of the body. I also found that because of all the finishing techniques involved in this knit, there's just a lot of places where it could go wrong or you could botch it uh, or do a bad job at doing it. I feel like that's what happens in terms of motivation. You know, it's not that you're a bad knitter or a bad finisher, but if you're just kind of getting impatient and you just want the finished object and you prefer knitting as opposed to finishing touches, there's a lot of room for you to to be sloppy i feel and then that could affect the final garment because even though you did a really great job at the knitting and the lace panel that's obviously taking the attention but if you did some bad finishing or bad eye cords then you could see that which then yeah it wasn't that those parts the finishing wasn't fun but it was necessary and i'm really 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 happy with the finished piece it's gorgeous i love the material the pure silk i was saying before when i used it for the first time i fell in love with and i think it deserves all the hype that it gets it's not too pricey like for a top like that i only needed two balls uh, and i bought them well those ones i received as a gift from my parents for my birthday so there's no final cost to this product but i know that if you buy two balls of pure silk and you buy them on sale it's less than 30 pounds um which maybe it's more than what you'd usually pay for a top, but for 100% silk top, that's a good deal. So I would definitely use this yarn again. I don't think I would make this top again because I don't think I need a million of them. And also I find them less wearable than other things. So that's the last thing that I guess I want to talk about with this project is I don't know what to wear with it. And you'll see in the photos, you know, and you'll see here, I'm wearing a beige bra right now and I'm not a huge fan of the fact that you can see it a little bit because the lace panel just goes so low on your body um, and it's also not bra friendly because the straps just aren't placed at the same location and when I'm wearing my linen shirt on top it's fine but you can still see the middle thing and I know Amy from Ninets wears a strapless bra with it which at least helps with this top part but yeah it's just 
maybe if I made a bralette or if I got a bralette that was like top colored as opposed to skin colored, I don't know. Give me any recommendations. What do you guys wear when you make laced knits? Especially the ones that have lace panels that come really far down the front. Usually I, I quite like going braless in, in summer and this is definitely not something that you can do with this top. So even though it is extremely comfortable to wear the top, the bra isn't necessarily. So then I know that I'm only going to be wearing this top when I'm dressing up and going out and about and like doing something. It won't be a top that I just sort of... Well, I could just relax at home with it, but you know, like I can't just go to the grocery st store and put that on because like it's just way too revealing, revealing without a bra. But yeah, uh, apart from, from that and the fact that it's hard to wear, I really, really like it. It was so much work and so much effort, especially in terms of finding the right size and the right fit and the right length. And I feel like all that hard work paid off because it's an extremely well-fitting top. And I guess what's also useful is then to have this as a blueprint or a way to know how long to make straps for future tops. I also really like this shape on me, the kind of like trapezoid shape coming up here with the straps as opposed to the tops that are just two triangles like my camisole number four I think that I personally prefer this for my body shape or just personality so I'm going to be looking for tops that follow that shape as opposed to the triangles for future summer knits I think so yeah I think that's it for this top overall really really happy with it but also very happy that it's uh, done and as always just always happy with Sari Norden's patterns they're really well written there's always charts and written instructions so whatever you prefer and they're full of little details and like clever finishings and polished so yeah but as always check out other people's notes because that's where I learned that I should join in the round immediately after finishing the lace panels and not doing any more stock in it. And I'm really happy with how um, low this ends up going on my underarm. I think it's a perfect length where it's not restrictive and it's not baggy. So yeah, it's, it's a success. I'm really happy with this top. Okay, so the second finished object then I will talk about is the Oslo hat by Petit Net. And I don't have it with me because that was a gift from my father. He requested it and he even requested a modification to it. He said that he would like me to Im to include or incorporate a Belgian flag on the brim of the hat. And I thought that was a, a, such a fun challenge and a great idea. Uh, I would have never even come up with that myself. And he was just like, he had this vision. So I used Filkelana Arweta held double in the colorway charcoal 956. And last time I showed it, I had just finished the brim and I was about to fold it. So the story here is that I was going to film a whole video on how to pick the location of the embroidery before you embroider because of all the folding and, and mirroring and everything and upside down, all of that matters to get the final result that you want. You have to take that into consideration and like reverse engineer it. So I was gonna make a video about that. And then I filmed the entire video, embroidered the flag and everything, and then I realized that I had gotten it wrong and I had filmed the whole video on how to get it wrong, which was very disappointing and a waste of a Sunday morning, but whatever. That footage is not usable. Uh, I'll show you what happened. Basically, that was the prop that I used where, you know, that was supposed to be the final hat with the little flag. And then I was unfolding this and I was like, okay, so here's where you have to put the flag in what order, blah, blah, blah. Because in my understanding, or the way that I had convinced myself it was, is that the hat was like that, where it was double folded. But what I forgot, and I knew this, but I just forgot about it, was that the hat is triple folded. So once I had finished my little flag, and I folded the flag correctly, the flag disappeared. And I'm so sorry if you've watched my episode a couple of weeks ago where I was confidently asserting that you had to place your flag in that corner. That was wrong. <laughs> so here's the corrected version you would have had to place your flag, you know, here, and then, yeah, it would have been on this side. So anyway, all that to say that I painfully ripped out all of that embroidery. I didn't undo any of the knitting, I just ripped out the embroidery. And then I just didn't have the heart to go down and unfold the brim and, and just redo it all over. Like, I just wanted it done at this point. So then I just finished the hat as normal, and then afterwards just went and did the embroidery and I just found it a bit harder and more fiddly because 
I didn't want it to show anywhere else but the front. I didn't want it to. I didn't want people to be able to see the backside of the embroidery. So it was just harder to do that because it was already pre-folded. So you didn't you didn't see your ends, and I found it a bit harder to secure them and hide them and everything. But it was doable. And then it made me wonder, is there even a point of me making a video like in the future about how to embroider the hat and figure out the placement before folding, if in the end it can be done after the folding? But maybe I'll, I'll still do it because it's a matter of preference of just like, what do you want to fiddle with? Figuring out the placement beforehand or figuring out how to embroider and hide your, hand, your ends after you finish the hat. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. That was like two weeks ago, so I'm kind of over it at this point. I don't even remember... Uh, much about this, but I sent off the hat in the post and sadly it has not arrived yet and it's been over a week So I'm a little anxious and so is my dad and we hope that it hasn't been lost in the European post but Yeah, if I get it if I if I hear from him before I edit this video and post it on Monday Then I'll add photos of him wearing it here But if there's no photo by Monday, then that means that he hasn't gotten it yet so yeah, uh, anyway, I loved making the hat. It was really, really fast. I know people complain that there's a lot of stockinettes because you're doing the triple fold, but I found it to be quite quick, actually, because once you fold the hat, it's exciting. There's stuff happening. And then there's not that much stockinette before you start the decreases. And then the decreases happen really fast. Like it was really, really fast to do, in my opinion. I love the yarn that I use, Filcona Arweta. I would definitely do it again in that yarn. I actually just, just barely cracked into my third skein of Arweta, so I'm sure that you could do the hat with only two skeins if you did the size adult, medium, or under, which I'm definitely keeping in mind for when I want to use hand dyed yarn for a hat, which I actually have plans for. If you see my latest video, I talk about wanting to make the Oslo hat with a DK way hand dyed, you can just make it with one skein. And next time I would do a provisional cast on just to make things easier afterwards to pick up the stitches. I think it would maybe make me more confident that I'm picking up the right column of stitches and I'm not twisting or crooking it. That's always my worry when double folded, double folding things, I'm always worried about, yeah, slanting the columns of knit stitches. And here's then the final price of that hat. I think I also bought that yarn on sale. So, and only used like, like I said, just a bit above two skeins. So a very affordable hat, which is also why if it has been lost in the post, I wouldn't be too, too sad about it. And I could make him a second one. So that if you're watching and your hat's still not here, I'll make you another one. <laughs> um, but yeah, the just, I guess the thing that I mentioned already, but I'll say it again, is that there's a bit of a typo in the decreases of the pattern, but I've corrected it and put my notes on Ravelry. And if you're an experienced knitter, you probably won't even notice because you'll be doing it, you'll be doing the right thing automatically. Uh, but the pattern actually does tell you like to do something that's not correct, which is a bit annoying. But it's a nice pattern that ranges over a few sizes for kids and adults, so it's very versatile. Also, I was able to do the whole hat on my circular needles, uh, except at the end when you do the decreases and then you have to use magic loop or DPNs. But I was able to do the whole circumference and everything on my nine inch circulars, is that what they're called? Or no, maybe 16 inches. The smallest of the Chayogu normal set, not like the mini sets. I really should know what the small needle size is. The same size that you'd use for a color, I did that on that and it was fine. Okay, then the last finished object of today's episode is a pair of socks and it's also from Sari Nordland and it's the Summer Girl Sock, which is uh, her third pattern of her summer sock knit along. And here they are. They are so cute. They're so pretty. I love the yarn that I chose for this. Um, I think for ruffles, people usually think of like pink or white cream and just like very light colors. But I really like having used that sort of saturated well, I guess it's kind of muted, but just like medium tone. Like they're not dark and you can see the details. You can see the slip stitch heel and the ruffle. And yeah, I really like the color. And then the yarn is a Merino Yak nylon blend. And the Yak just makes these so plush and soft and squishy and warm. And yeah, so I, I showed this in my last episode. I made these on two millimeter needles, like I usually do for socks. I really like the gauge that that gives me. I made the smallest size because I knew that they wouldn't be too tight as they're not any cables or anything like twisted stitches, like the first socks that would restrict me. I made the first one so quickly because 
there were so many different little steps to do so it was very addictive in that sense and then I stole a little bit for the second one then I made the second one and then I picked up and did the ruffle on both socks like the same day to make one ruffle it took about an hour and a bit more because I was watching other things at the same time and it was quite painful on my hands to be doing the ruffle on two millimeter needles but it wasn't necessarily evil you just had to do it and get through it. It wasn't that many stitches in the grand scheme of things, like, and it's only just a couple of ruffles. It's not like you had to do this all over a sweater multiple times. So it's not put me off ruffles, and the effect is just so effective. Like, there's really no other way of getting that type of um, look. I love that they're shorties. I have a couple pair of trousers that are just cropped enough that the sock comes in at just the right place where you can see the ruffle and then you can see a bit of skin and then you can see the trousers. I really love that look and they're really comfortable. I actually found my first sock to be just a tight too small so then the second sock I added a couple of rounds of stockinette. It played in my mind a little bit, you know, if you make the first sock and you notice something is wrong, do you make the second sock the same? and also wrong or do you correct the issue on the second sock and then you have mismatching socks but at least one of them fits correctly because my sort of like symmetry obsessed brain would have liked my two socks to be identical but the logic says well at least have one feet that feels good one foot that feels good anyway and then the other thing that i did was that on my first sock i may have mentioned that on my first epi on my l latest episode but you can see the um, the ribbing poking through because even though I followed the instructions when you fold it at the folding edge the folding edge is just vastly misaligned but not everyone had that issue on Ravelry so maybe it's just the way that my ribbing tension might be different than my stockinette so on the other sock I corrected that issue and I added two rounds of stockinette before folding the edge and I think that that's much nicer and straight um didn't do any modification, I apart from adding those two rounds of stockinette on the folding edge for that one. And then I also did a provisional crochet cast on for the socks instead of the one that she recommends, just because it's what I know how to do best. And yeah, I love the fit. I really like that gauge for socks on 2mm needles. And I was trying not to wear them too much to keep them nice for the podcast, but then now I'll be living in those because I, I still wear my woolly socks in summer here it's not really been preventing me from doing so and now the only thing i have left to do is to go back to the july pattern the minerva socks i really need to get finished on those i have two weeks before the end of august i really need to do that because i want to do the september socks like starting fresh so yeah wish me luck and tell me to finish my socks before casting on new ones thank you and then the final price for these socks because i used less than half skein of regia and i also bought that on sale on lovecraft i think so here's what they cost and then if you don't know the concept of the summer girl like of the summer sock cal from sari is that in september she releases a pattern that will use the leftovers of all three pairs so it's good to have the leftover yak because i'll be using that in the future uh, pattern hopefully next month so yeah very i'm i'm really impressed with that yarn sock yarn and i'll really buy it again although saying that who knows how they're gonna wear with time but if they wear well i will be buying that yarn again okay so let's talk about my works in progress let's talk about one that you have seen already it's the moonset tea by ozetta i'm doing this on 2.75 millimeter needles and i had problems with gauge it's on it it's honestly been so long since i've started this that i don't even remember my gauge anymore and what i had done but i picked the smallest size knowing that it would block to grow a little bit and that i'd rather have something that was a bit too small than too oversized so here's the t-shirt so far as you can see i don't know uh, how much you can see in the frame but yeah, it's going along quite well. I finished everything except the body, basically. And the body is just an eye cord. So I, I keep on trying this on and being like, can I just finish now? Can I finish now? But I still have a good four inches at least. Well, I guess no, three to four inches to go on the body. I've joined the neck to the back, which you're supposed to do at some point because there used to be a gap here, but I sew it down. The way you seam it is like you do a join, a mattress stitch between... Um, <clears throat> horizontal knitting and vertical knitting which Ozetta provides a very very helpful link in her pattern so that was 
daunting, same as the folded hem from Sari, but actually there was nothing to be scared of and it went really well and it felt very satisfying and clean, like everything aligned perfectly. I still need to cut the ends but I wove them in already at the back of the neck. And as you can see, I so I was doing the body for ages, I ran out of my first ball of yarn and so I did the sleeves with my second ball of yarn and now I'm using the second ball to finish the body. And the yarn I'm using is the Fibre Company Meadow, which is a mix of merino, llama, silk and linen. It's very summery. It's really comfortable. Like it's not soft as in like silky or, or brushed alpaca soft. It's a little bit rustic because of the linen. Like the, the linen brings it like a crispy element, but the llama is really soft. The merino is nice and elastic. So I really like the fact that it's a summer fiber, it's a summer yarn that uses merino and llama, uh, which is really handy for, for here in Scotland. Here's the back detail, like where you pick up for like the front. It's really nice, like I really like this. And I like the gauge on this, like the stitches are minuscule and tiny and I can feel it because I've been working on this for months at this point. So it is a tiny gauge, but I love how clean it looks and how professional it looks. I'm looking at this now and I can't really tell the difference between my flat tension and in the round tension, so that's pretty good. I've tried it on and I do think it's a little smaller and tighter than I wish, especially like in the sleeves as well. There's really not a lot of ease and it's a shame, but I know that if I were to make this again, I would pick the small size or like at least try to achieve those measurements. But I don't know if I'm gonna make this again. I really would like to, especially in pure silk. I think like a whole t-shirt based on, on that material. And I know my gauge here, like my gauge on the 275, I can just measure that and figure out what, what, what directions I need to follow based on that gauge. But it's just so much work. And if I were to make a size up, I'd have even more stitches to play with. So maybe, probably not next summer, maybe in two summers, if I'm ready. I need to finish this even before thinking of a second one. But I think that this might block out as well. I'm hoping so anyway. I'm hoping that it'll stretch out like widthwise everywhere. The sleeves went by really fast because like they're just so small. There were supposed to be one more set of decreases, but I skipped that because I was already aware it was quite tight. But I still wanted a little tapered shape, so I still did some decreases, just not all of them. Then for the eye cord bind off, I used the same technique I did on my home camisole. Kadri had a video on that, on how to graft your eye cord ending to your beginning. And I found that it gives a little bit of bulk, but it's relatively seamless compared to casting off the eye cord and trying to weave in that end. I really don't like doing that method because I think it leaves a lot of visible irregularities. So yeah, I think there's not a, there's not much else to say about this top. I really like it. I just, I need to be motivated to work on it. I really like the color that I picked. I think it's very natural looking and it's not always about picking neutrals. Like this is not necessarily a neutral. It's like a nice ochre brown, like golden color. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else. No, that's it. So yeah, wish me luck on how to on finishing this. I really want to finish it, you know, and wear it a bit in summer, in September and everything. So hopefully we'll finish this maybe by the end of August. Is that realistic? Maybe I'll take that on my trip to London and maybe a pair of socks to make sure I don't run out. Because, you know, like, I'm like, oh, maybe I can bring that to London. But what if I finish it in one day? But is that realistic? Oh, anyway, whatever. So the next pattern I will show you uh, is also something that you've seen. So I'll quickly, quickly show you because there's not that much progress that's been done on it since. And it's my Cozy Classic Light by Jessie Maid, which I am making with hand-dyed yarn from Zekami. And as you can see, I have added a neck. I don't know how much you can see this. Oop. So not much done apart from the neck. I was talking about that last time and in the end I didn't know if I wanted to do a double folded neck or a normal and I just did a normal one and then I did the tubular bind off. No, the Italian bind off. I didn't do any setup rounds. Just a normal bind off and this yarn is quite unforgiving for tension 
so the ribbing isn't looking the best but I'm hoping that it'll block out nicely especially the edge the sewn bind off edge I find that it's always kind of weird before block and sometimes it flares sometimes it pulls in like it's hard to keep your tension the same all around when you're doing Italian bind off but uh, hopefully that'll be fine and then I'm doing some decreases on the body like the pattern recommends option two for the decreases where you do them like all over the length of the body and I'm trying to aim for the full length if anything I want to add an inch to that definitely not the cropped length I really like the lifted increases at the raglan at first I considered just doing make one right and make one left like a usual raglan that I do but I thought no come on like let's go let's do what the pattern says and try something new and if you don't like it then don't do it again I'm glad that I did it's really really pretty if you remember the modification that I did with this top there's there's a couple of modifications I did in terms of the sizing but I talk about that at length in the in the previous episode because I was between sizes and I was between gauges so I've modified the number of raglan increases that I did and the number of underarm cast-ons so I've talked about that before and then the other modification is that I actually started the um, sweater like at the neckline and then I just picked up afterwards to do the neck up as opposed to starting as a tubular cast on here and working my way down and I thought that this cast on would give me more stability here where the cast on edge is as opposed to the tubular cast on which I've seen many people say stretches out so much over time and just like opens up opens up and, and gets lower on the body and when I tried this on I really really like the the spot that it hits me it's really like it's quite high it's not a funnel neck or anything it's just like the perfect location for the crew neck sweater to be so I'm really happy with that and doing the neck motivated me like gave me a little boost of this is looking more like a sweater now vibe and I really like the yarn it's an alpaca silk cashmere blend and it's really nicely hand dyed I'm alternating skines I only have two and my dilemma now is that I don't know if I should keep going up for the body and cast off and then do the sleeves because that would be easiest because the yarn is still attached to the body right now <clears throat> or what I want to do is I want to cut the yarn, do the sleeves and then come back into the body which is like probably the smartest thing to do which is probably what I'm going to do after I stop recording this I'll take the plunge, cut the yarn and do uh, the sleeves so hopefully next time that you see this it'll have some sleeve progress but there's not much else to update you on because it was just about doing the neck since last time okay the next project is a new cast on and it's also by Jessie Maid and if you follow me on Instagram you will have seen me uh, struggle so much with picking colors so it's the Northwood v-neck which is a drop shoulder striped v-neck sweater and it's a DK weight, you make it on 4.5 millimeter, but I'm doing it on 4 because I think Jessie Maid's gauges are always a bit too open for my liking and I just prefer a bit of a tighter needle, especially since I'm already a loose knitter. And I wanted to make this from, sta from stash entirely, either scraps from projects I had already done or from yarn that wasn't assigned to anything and so I was yeah just trying to use what I already had and I basically went on Ravelry looked at all the stash yarn I had that was in corresponding amounts amounts to what is required Jessie Maid has a nice helpful table where it tells you what what each stripe requires in terms of metrage and yardage so I did that on Ravelry then I went on Photoshop and played around for days with like the little stamping tool to like pick a color from the stash and then apply it to a stripe on the sweater so it was as accurate as possible I made a lot of sketches I'll show you here on screen what I did and it's like it was fun but it was taking away the time I had to knit because I was just doing that and in the end I, I settled on a combination I made a swatch so here's the swatch that I made and I shared that on Instagram and I was just like I'm still not feeling quite sure about it like there's still something wrong with this I don't like it as much as I did on the screen and people were very helpful and gave me tons of suggestions which was a little overwhelming because obviously I couldn't take into account everyone's feedback but some feedback was coming a lot of the time like this is too variegated there's not enough contrast between those two the blue doesn't go with the rest so after 
we went back to the drawing board, I did more sketches, and I did this final sketch that you will see here on screen. I even took, um, I took sort of photos of the yarn being swatched, and then I applied that effect to my sketch to make it look as realistic as possible. It was so fun. I'm, defi I'm definitely going to be trying to do that for, for more striped sweaters when I'm like thinking about things because it helps me visualize it and makes I don't want to be swatching for for ages and waste all that yarn so that's why doing it online is quite helpful but I shouldn't get lost in in the time wasting of just doing it over and over and not actually casting anything on but here's what we settled on and so I, I cast it on and I cast it on a few days ago and the progress has been incredibly fast because it's a drop shoulder which as you know is very like start and stop, lots of sections, lots of steps to do, which is addictive because it's never too far before, it's never too... The next step doesn't take too long to reach, so you're always close to doing the next step. And also there's stripes included, and I really like Jessie Maid's instructions for how to do the stripes. It's not just like designers who give you a sweater pattern and then they say, oh, and also do stripes every five rounds. Because it's like, well, thanks, I could have figured that out myself. Jessie made stripes instructions are very thought out. Like, she does all the guesswork for you, and you just have to follow that. So that was really nice. So I'll show you what I've got. And, yeah, here it is. Oh, you really can't see that. It's a bit hard with a v-neck, but I'll put my... Ta-da! So... Yeah, it's a very, very deep v-neck for now, Jessie Maid says. Uh, there are actually instructions on how to change the v-neck depth, if you prefer. But I also know that once I pick up for the ribbing at the neck, everything will cinch in quite a lot. And then here's uh, the sleeve that I picked up and started doing. I love it so much. I think the lines are so crisp uh, and straight. It's really nice. And I like, I changed the hand eyed that I'm using. It's less variegated than before, so this one is more of a tonal. There's still some subtle variation, but like, you know, so so does this part here. It has that like natural yarn variation. And then that one also has a bit of natural variation because this one here, the bottom, is a mix of cotton and wool. And I'm assuming they're dyed a bit differently or like they take onto the dye differently. That one is a flat color, which kind of grounds everything. So yeah, I, I think I did a good job with the colors, but the reason why I haven't continued the body is because I'm less sure about the colors I picked for the second half of the sweater. Like this combination I was quite confident with, and in the next few colors I'm like, oh, what if it doesn't work and I'm going to be disappointed? But I'll just need to cast on and see. And if I don't like it, I can always rip it, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. So I don't know if there's much else to say about this sweater. Like the big story about this sweater basically is the whole choosing the colors. I guess I'll talk about the the colors I've used. So I'll I'll put a photo of like the sweater here and I'll just talk about it. So the first one at the top is an olive green, like a very dark green, and that's from Raw Work. It's actually a sport yarn, not a DK, but it's very plump and lofty and it really like fluffs up and expands during washing. So even though it's a little bit more gappy at the moment than the other yarns, when it blocks, it'll fill the gaps. I'm confident. And I really like it. That one I, I had bought with the beige one as well for another test knit, but then it didn't meet gauge at all. And so I was left with this very fancy, pricey yarn that I loved the look of, but I didn't have a plan for. And so this came in so handy for this sweater. Then the next one is Knitting for Olive Merino in Dusty Olive. And that was gifted by Erica, a viewer. I talked about it a few episodes ago where she sent me a few yarns that she didn't like. She gave me two kinds of the merino. And so I'm holding that double and it's really, really nice. I love that yarn. It's so smooth. It's so elastic and bouncy. It just, it does what you want it to do. It's really nice. Then the next green is some non-superwash organic merino DK hand dyed by Zakami that I bought in their latest collection, The Door. I forgot the name of this color, but everything is on my Ravelry. And it's so beautiful. At first, in the sky, it didn't look that variegated. Like, it's a tonal, so it's like a uni color, but it's not a flat color. Even though it looked like that in the sky, I thought it would just be this bright green. But actually, when you look at it, when it's being knitted up and swatched, it has lighter and darker moments, but very harmonious and very 
regular no pulling like it's just looking it's looking perfectly i love it and it's also so smooth elastic bouncy not splitty it's a dream to work with and that was originally maybe going to be an oslo hat but i'm happy that i'm using it for this instead i think it's some people had told me to just like lose the bright green, lose the hand eye, it doesn't go with it. But I really wanted to keep it in because that's what was bringing the most joy of this project. All the other yarns I'm using are quite neutral or muted and I was just like, but that's the pop of color that will make me like this sweater and like reach for it. And it's a good way of bringing a bit of color in your life but not committing way too much and doing a whole sweater in that bright green. And the next color is like that beige, undyed which I said was also raw work undyed sport weight and I bought that and the green from beautiful knitters by the way they have a bunch of colors of the sport weight that are like dyed naturally and then a few that are not dyed naturally and a few of the natural colorways and they're all splendid I think beautiful knitters might be the only store in the UK that stocks raw work sometimes raw work comes in the UK and they do shows uh, sometimes some hand dyers one that I met in Gala Shields, uh, she was using the raw work base to use her naturally colored dyes. So, and I, I can vouch for the quality of the raw work. I love it. So if you are able to get your hands on some raw work, go for it. I recommend it. It's a bit more rustic and rough than other yarns, but I wouldn't call it itchy or scratchy. It's just not merino. And so it's nice to like experience that natural, <clears throat> natural woolly wool but it's still wearable next to skin, and but I'll be wearing probably something under that jumper anyway. And then lastly, the last color I've got here is um, oh, BC Garn Bio Balance, which is a fingering weight cotton merino mix or cotton wool, and I'm holding that double. And that was less nice to work with, I noticed, especially after working with all the merinos and the woolly wools that were very elastic and plump. That one is definitely less elastic than, than those, and so a bit more strain on my fingers as I'm knitting with it, but it's their stripes are relatively small, so you're never working with that color for too long, and then before you know it, you've already reached the next stripe, and then it's all fun and games. And the next color I intend to use, which is not here, and is the last one, is that gold color. And that's going to be, um, that's Wooly Knit Cone Merino in Cossetra Gold. And it's also a uh, fingering that I'm holding double. Which is the color I'm the least sure about, but I knew I needed something else than just greens. And I don't really have anything else. So, and I really didn't want to buy anything for this sweater, so... Yeah, it's fine. I'm hoping it fits. And if it doesn't, then that's fine also because not everything needs to be perfect. And the the main purpose is it needs to be, you know, fitting me clothes I can wear and using stash. So yeah, and I really like this pattern. I definitely want to make it again. Well, I haven't finished it obviously, but I think it's gonna be so versatile, especially once I finish mine and I know what amounts of yarn I used, like even more precisely for every color. I, I can't wait to plan more of those stripy jumpers. I really want a blue one, like maybe blue with an orange stripe for like the contrasting colors. I think it's, the possibilities are infinite. And if you want to make that sweater, let me know and I'll definitely go spy on your color choices. If you go on Instagram, the hashtag or on Ravelry, some people have done a monochrome color or like just two colored stripes. They've done thinner stripes, like it's, just, like I said, so versatile. And this project makes me really happy. I'm so happy I finally cast it on because the thinking work took so long before getting to that stage of me actually casting this on. So I'm glad that I'm finally doing it. Oh yeah, and then the last thing that I didn't mention is because my gauge is a bit different, I'm doing a size medium because I want the measurements of a size small. And Jessie Made, again, gives instructions on how to maybe make the sleeves as well fit you differently. But I'm not doing any modifications to the pattern. I'm just doing everything as she says. And then if I realize I don't like anything, I'll know for the next iteration of the sweater that I make. Okay, uh, the next thing is something that you have seen before, but I didn't talk about last time. So the next project you've seen before, and it's the cardigan number seven by My Favorite Things Knitwear. Ugh, cardigans are a mess to show, aren't they? So I don't know what's gonna be on screen. So I'm 
doing a sleeve right now. I've just picked up for it and I finished one entire sleeve. And I finished every uh, like ribbing detail for the button band and the bottom at the end. So we're really, really close to being done with this. I just need to finish the sleeve and I know that this should only take a couple of days maybe if I work on it the whole time. Um, I'm following the pattern basically as, as recommended for my size because I'm on gauge. I didn't want to think, I just wanted to follow instructions and this pattern is very, very beginner friendly. If anything, it's too much so. I really wish I had a bit more interest, but obviously like I knew what I was getting in. The only thing I've added to make it more um, to, to make it fit better is I've added short rows at the back of the neck. I've talked about that in my previous video or like the last time I talked about this and I put instructions on how to do that on my Ravelry with like the stitch counts and everything like how many stitches past markers etc because I, I know that for some people like just saying add short rows doesn't actually mean anything me included so I've just done a bit of trial and error and here's the numbers that I landed on and I quite like how it fits I actually, I really, really like the fit of this cardigan. I don't know if the short rows added a huge amount of like benefit, but I like the raglan depth. I like um, the shape. Even though it's simple, it fits well with my short rows at least. And then I've also added short rows at the bottom hem. And that wasn't necessarily to add length to the back compared to the front but just more to even things out and to have it like level out because with postures and like the shape of your back and everything, usually when you're wearing a cardigan or a sweater, but I feel even more so a cardigan, the front has a tendency to like dip lower, which makes the back of the cardigan rise higher on your back. And you know, if you're wearing like normal trousers, maybe that leaves then some skin exposed and then you get like chilly. So I just wanted to make the back a bit lower to counteract that. And I've also shown on my Ravelry the instructions on like what numbers, what rows I ended up doing. I did three sets of short rows at the neck and then three sets of short rows at the hem. And really, really happy with that. Then I did all the button bands and I did that in the rib like recommended. And then I did a sewn bind off to make it stretchy. But I really struggled, especially at the, at the corners, because the way that you do this, my favorite things knitwear, she says to do this like sort of salvage edge or like, yeah, a, a, a slip stitch edge, which means that when it comes to doing the uh, Italian bind off, you know how you have like knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, you start and you end with two knit stitches next to each other. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out what to do about that. I didn't know how to set up my yarn and my needle before starting the sewn bind off. I didn't know like if I had to do the instructions for the knit stitch twice or if I just assumed it, would, it was a purl stitch. So I just kind of improvised and I'm not a huge fan of like how sloppy it looks. Maybe I'll show a couple close-ups of what like my edges look. So yeah, I'm not, not a fan. I, I'm looking at it now and it's just not the best. And it made me lose a bit of motivation on the on this card again, but I feel like because of how chunky it looks anyway, it's almost like it's gonna look sloppy anyway. Like not to say that about anyone's skills or anything, but I just feel like because it's gonna be a big oversized, chunky, very airy, loose gauge cardigan, it's gonna be hard for it to look neat, if that makes sense. So I've I've given up on, on perfection. <laughs> but yeah, the sleeve and yes, yeah, so the sleeve normally is just a straight sleeve, but I've added uh, three decreases and I was doing that during a virtual knit night and I was just knitting away on my sleeve and twice I realized that I was supposed to have done a decrease already, but I forgot. So then that means that instead of having my decreases every 15 rounds like I wanted, it's like, you know, 15, 17, 18 or something like that, but it's fine. I just wanted a little bit of decreases for a little bit of shaping and I'm glad that I did. I also put the instructions on that on my Ravelry. And then you have a bit of a balloon sleeve effect that my favorite things knitwear explains and then you have the, again, sewn bind off at the end. And then the very last modification that I did on this cardigan is that I added a faux seam at the side. 
I don't know if you're gonna be able to see. I can barely even see it myself. I'll show a close up. But basically what you do is you knit all the way as recommended. Then once you reach that moment, you unravel that whole stitch all the way to when you cast it on. Then you take a crochet hook and then you go into the horizontal bars between the stitches. And you know, it's like if you drop a stitch and then you go back bar by bar, you rehook your stitch through every bar individually. In this technique, you go through under one bar, pull it up, and then under two bars, pull it up, under one, under two, under one, under two, over and over. And what that does is that it kind of like cinches in and creates a slip stitch edge that I think adds a bit of structure, visual interest and dimension to what would be otherwise a very monotonous big chunk of rectangular fabric where nothing is happening. And I wanted to try this out on this low stake cardigan first to see if I liked it before incorporating this technique into other knits that I cared more about and the verdict is that I really like it so I recommend it and I've done the exact same thing on the sleeve which you might not be able to see just here between the like just next to the stitch markers it goes up all the way and then I did the ribbing normally so yeah I don't know if you're gonna have been able to, I don't know if you'll have seen much of that, but yeah. Then the last thing I need to do is obviously finish the sleeve and then add some buttons, which I had bought in Belgium. They're like gray and mottled a little bit. So, oh, you're not gonna be able. Those are the buttons that I chose. So yeah. I'm quite excited to finish this and have it ready for colder days. I really, really need more cardigans. I keep on saying that. I just don't like making them as much. I find them more boring and I'm more likely to stop halfway through because I remember doing the yoke for this in, in, such, in such little time and then just giving up for, for ages. And then I did so much progress on the button band, like in a, in a couple of days. Then I let it again simmer for ages. Like I just need to focus on it because I know that I will wear this every day once I have it and it's a bit colder. And I really like the yarn I've used. I've used Drops Air in light gray and then Midnight Sol from Camarose in also like Ask Gray. And I really, really like the Midnight Sol. It's a mohair alternative that doesn't itch like at all I find and it gives the exact same fluffy result it's the same lace weight and metrage I think or it has a bit less metrage or like you might need to buy more balls I got four balls of that and it'll be enough and I'll have um, I have too much drops air because I was using that from stash which is a bit annoying because I wanted to get rid of that stash of that drops air that I've had since forever so I think I'll just I think I'll have three extra balls and I'll just probably donate them to either like my, my local charity shop or next time I see a knitter in person, I'll ask them if they want uh, Drops Air. I'm a little nervous about Drops Air and whether it's going to be, whether it's going to be of poor quality and more likely to pill or felt. I've heard people say that like, because it's, it's a blown yarn, it's a net of fibers with alpaca in it and they say that at some point the alpaca almost just escapes the net and then you just have the net and I really don't want that happening especially like at the underarm they're saying so I'm kind of pessimistic about this sweater this cardigan I don't think good things are gonna happen to it like within the next year but it's okay um at least I'll know and I already had a yarn anyway so yeah let me know if you've made anything in drops air and whether it's durable and do you still have things that you've made that look good or I'm hoping that the at least the um, midnight soul is going to add some stability and structure I know some people have made gauge for this pattern without using a second strand but I really wouldn't have liked it to be way too floppy and mm, how to say like it's very flimsy 
just the drops air and the gauge is too big so that's why i like having that mohair that second strand of i think it's a, it's a silk core i want to say but i don't even know anymore to add structure and to make sure that it doesn't fall apart i hope that makes sense anyway so that was cardigan number seven by my favorite knitwear it really probably will be done by next time that i see you oh yeah the last thing is that i'm using uh i think six millimeter needles for this and it's hurting my pointer finger when I'm pushing the stitches, the way that I knit English style is I wrap my yarn around and then... Yeah, I, I put my needle into the stitch, wrap my yarn around, and then to get it out, I might use my pointer to like help push everything like out. But yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I, I was at knit night and I was just noticing that with the repetitive motion of doing the whole sleeve in like a couple hours, it was getting really really sore so that's also why I've not been working on this as much is because it's a little bit more painful so yeah I just miss my smaller needles okay the last work in progress that I will show you then is very very exciting and I bet that you'll be able to guess why when I show you the swatch are you ready oh. do you recognize this Yes, so I will be test knitting the Alder sweater by Rebecca Klo from the Korea Bea. And I'm so excited. I had applied for it. Um, I, 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 I know I said I wouldn't do any more test nets for a while, some time ago. And I was true to my word, I'd never applied for any test net over the last few months. Even though I was so close to, a few times I had even filled half the form then came back to reason and, and left the page. But that one I was like, well, Rebecca is going to get hundreds, if not thousands of applications. Well, probably just hundreds, hundreds of applications for the sizes. And I probably won't get picked. Like I've applied for a lot of her test nets and had never gotten chosen. So I didn't think I had high chances. And I thought, you know, worst case scenario, I don't get it. But um, I can always buy the pattern when it gets released. And then to my surprise, I was chosen and I was like, oh, Okay, now I actually have to do it. Wow, okay. So I'm glad I didn't do any test nets for a long time because that means I'm more ready and like in the right mindset with all the energy. Like I'm all back to like my test knitting meter is full so I can do it. And this swatch was made with the raw work actually. So the beige and then the dark green that is now in my Northwood V-neck. And just to see if it would meet gauge and it does. This is on 3.75 millimeter needles and also I got used to the stitch pattern, I really liked it. But I wanted to try to switch the colors around to see if I would like the white to not be the main color. I wanted to use yarn from Stash for at least one of the colors, I promised myself, because I didn't want to just continue participating in test knits and buying new yarn for them, because that was kind of throwing me off my rhythm and my plans for the yarn I already had in Stash. So I kept the beige raw work because I already had like three skeins of it and I know that the Northwood v-neck isn't going to use more than one skein. So I have enough of the white to be the contrasting color and then for... no, yeah. And then for the main color I went with... Uh, Retrosaria Vovo. So here's the green that I picked very pretty i think that it's been dyed on like black sheep wool because it's so rich and like there's so much depth to it it's definitely like a bit heathered it's not just a, a flat color it's really soft like it's not soft like merino but it's not itchy it's like very plump squishy a little dry to the touch but really comfortable so I think that this is a really good yarn for if you want something, again, that's like a little more wooly than merino, but not something that is not tolerable. And uh, Retrosaria is a brand that has like a really good ethics and a very vast variety of different yarn weights and fiber contents. So I highly recommend checking them out and checking out different yarns because I'm sure that they would be something that suits your needs. And then I'm using the, the, the beige one for the main color. I think it's the color sand. And are you ready for what I've got so far. Ta-da! Oh, it's so pretty, isn't it?
And here's the raglan. How beautiful is that? It's stunning. Although I'm still kind of, I don't know, in a way, I maybe still preferred how the stitch pattern looked with white as the main color. But when I look at this, I really do like the green as the main color. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think I should have inverted the colors? Oh, it, it's, it's great. And Rebecca was a little worried that people, testers, were maybe going to struggle with the beginning of the construction of the sweater because the way that she does her short rows is she has you do the beginning of the sweater flat and you do a little crescent shape and then you join in the round when the short rows are done in order to continue the raglan increases and do uh, the body in the round from that point onwards. She was worried people were going to struggle with that, but there were no issues with it. Everybody seems to be getting on like really fine. I personally found it extremely clear. The instructions are row by like row by row and you get instructions on how to incorporate the raglan increases into the stitch pattern. So there's really not there, there's no guesswork involved, which is exactly what I like in my patterns. I don't necessarily want my hands to be held all the way, but this pattern just does the right amount of, of, of explanations. So kudos to her. That was, that, that was fantastic. Had a lot of fun. It is definitely much slower than a normal sweater. The deadline for this is in quite a while. I think it's like beginning of October, which is why also I didn't, I, I learned that we'd be doing this test net, I think a couple of days after I filmed the previous podcast. And I just started this like a couple of days ago. And yeah, because I know I can make a sweater usually in four weeks, give or take, probably less if I work on it like religiously. And, I, and the test net is like two months, but I see why now, because there's never a round where you're just knitting. There's always something happening. It's never too complex and it is intuitive in that I don't necessarily need the pattern next to me to do the, the rows, the four row repeat for now but um, it definitely takes a bit of focus and because there's a lot of stitches you're manipulating, uh, I don't want to slip any or twist any, like I've got to make sure my needles are going into the right amount of stitches, etc. So yeah, I hope maybe it becomes more of second nature, but right now I'm finding it a bit laborious and just the, the knowledge that the entire sweater, like that's it, that's all there is for the rest of the sweater is that stitch repeats. But the result of it is going to be so worth it. I love all over color work or all over texture. I love the look of it, but I personally don't usually gravitate towards these because I know that they're a lot of work and I'd rather have something a bit easier. But I know I'll be happy to have this sweater. And let me know what you think of my color choice. And let me know if you intend to make that sweater. What color combination are you going for? And are you making the dark color your main color or vice versa? But yeah, super excited about that. I probably will pick up for the neck really soon just to see how it sits and then we'll continue the raglan increases and I can't wait to show you how it looks. As you can see there's quite a lot of green in my life right now. I've, I've clearly been having a, a green moment. It is one of my favorite colors and it's nice to be sort of experimenting with all the different variations of that like bright lime green that was the color of the summer which I was attracted to but it's kind of nice experimenting with all the different variations of that color to see which one I like best. I think this one is a bit too bright for me, like I said, if it was the only thing that I was wearing. And that one is more wearable because it's not that bright and the Volvo is, like I said, a bit heathered and muted. So yeah, it's it's nice. I just, green makes me happy and I've been really enjoying all my green projects at the moment. Then the last thing I will talk about before my voice goes is acquisitions and plans. So one of the plans that I wanted to do uh, was that I, I I found this yarn in my stash. It's Retro Zarya Brusca, which is a worsted weight, woolen spun, uh, natural color here. It's color B yarn that is 100% wool. 50 gram is 125 meters. And originally I had bought this to make the test net for Iris, which was the Oh, the, the Haley sleepover, which by the way is out as of today. So if you liked my version of it a few episodes ago, you can now make up your own vest. 
So I originally wanted to make it in this yarn. I thought it would go really well with the stitch pattern and the cables, but I could only get four balls of this and I would have required more. So sadly, I, I was thinking if I get more yarn in the future, I can make a sweater quantity, but this is just never in stock. I've not found any more of that color, which is very frustrating because four balls is, you really can't make a lot with it. But trolling on Ravelry, looking at my stash like amounts and thinking what can I make with this yarn, I thought originally that I could make a stripe in my Northwood v-neck, but I found a better project, which is the Cameo Vest by uh, Orlan Zuc, Zuc, sorry, and um, I swatched with it just to see if it would work then with the needles, and here's the tiny little swatch. So it's a lovely little stitch pattern with some triangles made of some sort of knots or wraps, that's the right way up. And it's really cute and I really like it, I like the yarn, I like the stitch definition, it meets gauge, so, and the vest, if I make it like a bit cropped and I really don't stray too far, I'm able to do with only just those four balls, so wish me luck. It shouldn't take too long of a project, it's bottom up, which is a bit daunting for me, and also it's made flat, but I really want that vest in my wardrobe, and I want to see if I can make it with that yarn I've had in stash since pretty much January or February, so I want it out, and I love the stitch pattern, I think it's so cute. Actually, you know what, story time. I wasn't gonna tell you this, but I um, just saw the swatch here. I originally had swatched with a different yarn, and my very first time following the pattern is gave me this. So as you can see, uh, that's not the stitch pattern. Those are yarn overs and eyelets, and they're not done really well either. There's like bumps and everything, as you can see on, on the back. So yeah, I, I followed the pattern wrong, and, and this is what you're supposed to, to get. So this is kind of... If it makes you feel better, uh, you make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time, and I'm glad that that mistake appeared in the swatch. And after that, I looked at the photos in the pattern, and I was like, "Hers doesn't have holes in it. Like, am I doing something wrong?" And then I reread the pattern description, and I was like, "Oh yeah, okay, yeah. There's one step that I did wrong, and the effect is huge." <laughs> so really happy that I I figured out the mistake before going into the pattern, and that's what swatching is for. So, yeah, <laughs> little mistake. Then the next swatch I've made is for the Sila sweater, and this is using Borsta Alpaca by Sendless Garn, which I bought on sale, and in this lovely, lovely blue color. I love, love, love this color. The yarn is amazing. It's so soft. It's not the funnest to work with while doing the swatch. I don't like the big needles. It's quite catchy, like kind of like Eco Soft from Isiger if you've worked with that, but you get used to it. It's just obviously not the same experience as knitting with your other wools. And this is this is 100% alpaca, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a sweater I want to do by Jonah Hiatella. There's a cal going on until the 30th of September, so I'm not in a rush, but probably should cast that on quite soon. And it'll just be a normal raglan, quite oversized. And the reason I haven't cast this on is because I want to finish my cardigan number seven, but this color is so beautiful and I really want to have a nice cozy light blue jumper. And that'll look really good in winter, I bet. Like it's a winter kind of color. It's really soft, close to skin. And yeah, again, the stitches are not perfect, you know, and that's what I was saying with, when you have big yarn and big needles like that, it's just so hard to get something that looks neat. So it's not like I'm gonna try to, like I'm not gonna try and get blood from a stone and try and get perfect stitches because the yarn just makes it impossible. I just have to lean into that messy look. And I do like the finished garments. I, I still prefer garments that are, that have smaller stitches, but I, I want a project I can finish quite fast. So yeah, it's a bit of a give and take. And then the very last project that I want to talk about, and then that's it, is that I got some yarn from Pigment and Ply, some hand-dyed. She was advertising it on her Instagram, and I love that colorway. It's like candy cotton, candy cloud. It's called The Triumph of Time. It's Surrey Alpaca Silk Lace Weight, 
300 meters per 50 gram and I found the perfect yarn to hold it with. It's the Rerum Natura Gilead. Ooh. And it's the colorway Quartz. And I got this on sale because there's a Scottish shop that is closing down. Um, Great British Wool. And so she's doing this for 12.70 instead of 15 pounds per ball. And I only need, needed four balls. So that was a really good deal. And here's the two colors together then. Uh, I think it looks perfect. So I swatched with it, which I will show you. And basically, I want to make the season sweater by Ozetta, which is half fisherman's rib. But the way that Ozetta does her instructions for that one is that uh, one row is knit one below pearl, knit one below pearl, and you alternate that with pearl rounds which means that you're purling for 75% of the jumper, which I know is going to put me off and I won't want to do the jumper. So I saw the notes of someone on Ravelry who said that they didn't want that either. So what they did was that they did the sweater inside out. So what they did was that they did purl one below, knit one all over, and then alternated that with knit one, with knit rows. So that way... If you reverse that, you get the right side of the half fisherman's rib. So I'll tell you, I'll show you what that looks like in practice. So here's what I knitted. This is like the pearl one below knit one and then the knit one rounds. And then you get this texture. Then what you do is if you flip that inside out, this is now what you get as the right side, which is exactly what brioche or half fisherman's rib is supposed to look like on the bright side so so yeah so that's what my sweater would then look like and I don't see why this wouldn't work like I think I'm a bit daunted by it because I don't want it to go wrong and for me to end up with a sweater that's half inside out half right side out or having like my pickup seams being on the wrong end but I think it's a nice challenge and I won't talk about that too much right now because I obviously haven't cast it on. But I wanted to show you what the two yarns looked together, tell you my plans about doing a whole sweater inside out. And if you have any advice on or, or experiences of having done that, did it turn out okay? How do you do the neck pickup? Like, do you do it before or after? Do you do it right side in, right side out? I have a lot of things to figure out, but I wanted to test out obviously the gauge, first of all and then the two yarns together, and then the stitch pattern. And I'm off gauge, but I'll be doing the size extra small to compensate. The yarns go really well together. I think you see a bit of blue and a bit of yellow, and like the light pink is the main color. Light pink is usually not my color, but I'm curious to see if I like it. I want to experiment, and if I don't like it, I don't like it. But I, I quite like how this is looking already. And... Yeah, I only bought three bits of the scurry, of the Surrey and four balls of the, the Rurum. So overall, it is a bit of a pricey sweater because of the uh, hand-dyed Surrey, but not too expensive because the yardages aren't crazy. Okay, I think that's everything. I think this video might be the longest again. I know that last time I made a podcast, that was the longest it had ever been, and I may have just beaten my record. No one has complained so far, so I guess I won't apologize, but oh, you really can feel it after speaking for an hour and 20 minutes. I, it's insane. But I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you liked my new projects that I've cast on. I'm quite excited at this moment to clear off the needles of the things that I've had on for too long and then making room for all the new projects, especially the, the, the green ones, the autumn ones, and... Like everyone, I'm, I'm kind of really getting in the mood for autumn knits. I might be filming a plans for autumn video if I find inspiration for it. If, if I sit down and think about what are my plans, I'll be happy to share them with you. But as of right now, I don't really have any plans for autumn. So yeah, we'll see if I if I get inspired to, to do something like that, if you're interested. And personally, like personal life, everything is good. We are going to London next weekend so that'll be really nice and I'll be going to the yarn shops I'll try and film stuff but I don't know if I'll be making a vlog per se because it is quite a lot of work and effort and it takes away from the day and I still don't know what kind of format I want to do for vlogs and like what 
is boring, what is enjoyable. I don't think I would include anything that's not really yarn related. Like I'd, I'm not gonna go and look for nice cafes and restaurants and put that in the vlog. So I don't know. And then uh, it was my boyfriend's birthday uh, this week. And a couple of days ago, we went to Edinburgh French Festival then for his birthday to see something that he requested. We, we did an escape room first and it was so fun. He didn't know that we were gonna do that. And you know, it was like, it was risky. It was our first time doing that together. And it was like, oh, is our relationship going to survive the escape room? But it did because we're both quite competitive and driven and like he likes Sudokus and puzzles. And it was, it was such good fun. And then we went to see a show at the Fringe, which was the Little Shop of Horrors. It was a production like from Fife that did the show. And I had never heard of the show before or seen it. Ross really likes it. So I went in completely blind and it was so great. And ever since that day, I've been listening to the soundtrack on Spotify over and over, getting obsessed, getting slowly pulled into the fandom because I know that the movie has like a cult following. So yeah, I feel like I've been living under a rock for so long that I never heard any song from that musical, but it was so good. And yeah, I want to discover more musicals. I quite like a lot of them, but it always takes me ages to get into something new and, and like, try new things so it was nice that he introduced me to that and we had a really good time but uh, Edinburgh was so busy we we're walking in the Royal Mile and it was just so busy I can't wait for August to be over and for the city to return to normal levels of busyness uh yeah anyway that's it for life news I think but I hope that you're all doing really well wherever you are and I wanted to once again thank you for watching this video, any of my videos, for leaving comments, liking the videos, anytime that you guys send me a message or interact or or show your love, it means so much to me, it makes me really happy and it makes this hobby even more fun than it already was. So thanks so much and if you like this content then yeah, subscribe if you haven't already, join me on the other social media and maybe share this video around with other nitty friends if you think that they would enjoy the content. I'll see you all very soon, and in the meantime, happy knitting! Bye!